like to welcome you to our sixth annual One Book, One Region kickoff. My name is Betty Ann Ryder. I'm head of adult services here at the Groton Library, and I've been involved with this project since its beginning. It sounds like fun choosing a book for everyone in Eastern Connecticut to read, doesn't it? Yeah, well, sometimes it is. <laughs> and sometimes it isn't. Um, we have a great committee, most of whom are here today, and we get together um, starting in October, and we start reading books and more books, and usually even more books. And I'll tell you, um, the glamour wears off very quickly. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, usually around December when we haven't found the book, um, people are starting to um, wonder about this whole project. Um, when we make our choice each year, we're looking for more than a good story, though. It needs to have some substance, some quality that brings people together to discuss what they've read. The libraries like to be able to offer related programs. Over the years, this has led to some very memorable evenings for me. I've hosted one of the original Negro League baseball players, a lecture on voodoo in Haiti, a panel from the FBI and the CCLU debating civil liberties, and last year, a Holocaust survivor. We show films and we have family programs like kite making and building gingerbread houses. And this year, I have to say we got very lucky. It was one of our easiest and earliest decisions. Um, when we read Across a Hundred Mountains, we knew that we had found the perfect balance of a good story and a timely topic. And even better than that, we're all still speaking to each other. <laughs> Before I introduce our guest, I, I want to, uh, send out some thank yous, though, to people who um, help us over the course of this project. Um, the committee, of course, and as I said, many of them are here today, and um, I have a list of them up out in the hallway, and I, I do thank them because it really is a fun project. But I have to tell you, people do drop out of the committee because it's a lot more work than you might think. Um, reading a lot of books and even starting a lot of books and, and realizing very quickly that they're not going to work and just dropping them because you need to get on to the next one to, to find the perfect story. Um, the other uh, groups that I'd like to thank um, are the Community Foundation of Southeastern Connecticut for their continuing support. They've been with us since the beginning and really um, are the reason we're able to do this every year. Um, the Bolton Community uh, Foundation has also been generous this year, the North Stonington Education Foundation, and the NFA Class of 1997. Programs will be taking place at libraries throughout the region all summer long. Um, bookmarks and flyers were on the back table for individuals to pick up. If you're here from a library, though, or a school or, or some organization that is going to be promoting the book, um, in the kitchen in the back before you leave, please stop by because we have beautiful posters for you and we have um, packages of bookmarks, you know, multiple copies. So please uh, stop by and get some of those before you leave. And one more reminder, um, check our One Book, One Region website. Uh, it's at onebookoneregion.org um, for the latest information on all of the events that are going along, uh, happening throughout the region. Um, you're also invited after this event um, to Bank Square Books and Mystic to meet the author and to have your book signed. So we hope to see some of you there as well. And now I'd like to introduce Jim Land here from Norwich Free Academy, who has also been with this whole project right from the start. <laughs> Well, once again, we get to take a trip. And I look at some of the books that we've done in the past, and we've been to Afghanistan, we've been to Haiti, we've been to New York City in, in Brooklyn um, right after World War II had ended. We were in the future, or maybe it's not the future anymore, but the, when the book was written, it was in the future, when we read Fahrenheit 451. Uh, maybe actually some of that stuff is still happening today, and it's even more frightening now than to think about it. Well, this year we get to go to Mexico, and the southwestern portion of the United States near Los Angeles. And we get to hear about a story about a very, very timely topic. We're talking about immigration. And people get confused between two topics. Um, there's the, this thing called immigration. And I bet if I asked right now, how many of you have to only go back one generation to somebody who didn't speak English in your family. Please raise your hands. 
How many have to go back two generations? Yeah. So over half the, uh, of this audience only has to go back one or two generations to somebody who didn't speak English. Well, I can tell you about my grandfather um, when he came over from Germany and they decided to change the spelling of his last name. So all of us know those types of stories. And I know what my grandfather wanted. He wanted his children to do better than he did. And he certainly wanted his grandchildren to do even better. Well, it's unfortunate my grandfather never met any of his grandchildren. Um, and his grandchildren are doing much, much better um, because he was able to start a new life here. Well, our author talks about starting a new life and the human drama of heartache sometimes, some very tough decisions that have to be made. And those are the types of things that we're going to get a chance to read. Our author has come to us. She's originally from Mexico, now living in Los Angeles. She came to the United States at age nine. I had the opportunity yesterday to talk to our author for uh, about an hour, and I can see that if she's as engaging as the book was, I think we're in for a really great time in the next few months as we take the opportunity to read the book, discuss the book. I always talk about my na one of my neighbors who's um, quite elderly, and how she stopped one of the girls walking down the street one day about three years ago and said, hey, did you read that book, The Kite Runner? <laughs> and, and here's this, this conversation between this 80-year-old woman and this 14-year-old girl that probably never takes place unless everyone is sharing that common experience of reading those books together. So that's the goal of what we're trying to do. And I think, once again, I think we have that opportunity. So I'd like to introduce the author, of Across 100 Mountains, Rena Grande. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's such an honor to be here. Um, I want to thank Betty and Jim and everybody else that was involved in the committee in selecting my book. And I want to thank you guys, too, for coming out and supporting. It means a lot to me um, to, for my book to have been chosen for this wonderful program. Because it wasn't easy to get this book published. And one of the things I heard from many editors was that an immigrant story doesn't sell and nobody wants to read it. <laughs> so um, when Betty emailed me and told me how that they were thinking about choosing my book, it really um, made me think a lot about what the editors had said, and, and I said, they were way wrong. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, as Jim mentioned, I was born in Mexico, and one of the things that happened to me in my life that, that were very, um, that really affected me, even now as an adult, it still affects me, was uh, the fact that my parents had to leave me behind when they came here to the United States. And I was born in a very poor family. I know it sounds kind of cliche to talk about like poverty and, and, and um, but that's, that was my experience, living in a little shack made of sticks and cardboard with a dirt floor, no running water, and no toilet even. We had an outhouse. Um, so for me, that, that was something that was very difficult to deal with when, when I was very young, the fact that my parents had left me. My dad left when I was one, my mother left when I was five. And my earliest memories of my childhood don't include them. I had no, no memories at all of, of who my parents were. And um, so what, what I remember was more about me being raised by my grandmothers and my older sister, who was only four years old, that, older than me, she was the one who kind of gave up her childhood in order to become a mother to us. Um, so that was pretty much my existence when I was young in Mexico. And one of the things that I remember the most is just being really afraid that I was never going to see my parents again and that they were going to forget about me or something was going to happen to them. 
And just that fear that, that I lived with throughout, throughout my life in Mexico of not, not being with them anymore. Um, so my father came back to Mexico when I was almost 10 years old. And he had originally come here because he wanted to build us a house and get us out of that little shack where we live. And he did, he started sending money. And, um, and when my mother came here, she also started sending money. So they eventually did build that house. But my father realized that if they were to go back to Mexico, we would be living in a better house, but they still wouldn't have a way of providing for us. So my dad changed his plans and he decided that instead he was gonna bring us here to the United States because he had seen um, the opportunities here and, and, and he saw something for our future here in the States. So he brought us here, we came here without papers. Um, my parents didn't have papers at the time and it wasn't until 86 when they had the amnesty that my parents were able to get their green cards and then we were able to also get our green cards. So when I got to high school, I had a green card and for me that, that opened up you know, all the doors because before that I hadn't really thought about going to college or, or continuing with, with a higher education because I thought that I wasn't gonna be able to. But since I came here, my dad, he, um, the first thing he told us was that we were, we were here so that we could go to school and he always threatened to send us back to Mexico. We didn't, we didn't go to school. So you can imagine that throughout middle school and high school, I was a, a um, straight A student, perfect attendance every semester. Um, so my dad, whenever he got the report cards, he, since he had nothing to complain about, he would complain about the one tardy that I had. So we, we could never please my dad, let me tell you. But, um, but he had very high you know, standards for us. So even if we were sick and had the flu or, or anything, we were still going to school. So that made me a very good student. And by the time I got to um, college, I, was, um, I got a job in college as a writing tutor. And I was actually helping the students who were born in this country to, um, I was helping them write, to write their essays, which I always found to be kind of strange. But I, I guess I, you know, because I came here and I didn't speak English, I, um, I, I, I read a lot of books. I, I was totally addicted to books when I, when I got, before I got here, I had never really read anything. And then when I got here, I wanted to learn English as quickly as possible. So for me, it was reading. And, and my school was a few blocks away from the public library. So every Friday I would walk in there, check out the 10 books that we were allowed to check out. And I'll carry them home and read them throughout the, the week. And then I'll come back the next Friday again and, and um, return those 10 books and get new ones. And at that time, because you know, I didn't really have anybody tell me like what I should be reading. I was just pretty much grabbing anything that, that caught my attention. So I was really hooked on um, Sweet Valley High and Christopher <laughs> Pike. And then after Christopher Pike, I moved on to Stephen King because I love getting scared. <laughs> and then when I got to high school, I started reading cheesy romance novels which was not a good idea, because when you want to be a, a real, a serious writer, you don't want to read romance novels. <laughs> so when I got to college, I obviously, my love for, for books kind of turned into, you know, my love for writing also. And, and I, back then, I wasn't, I didn't really see myself as a writer, because I was very artistic and being left-handed. How many of you guys are left, lefties? Yay! <laughs> I'm left-handed, I'm so proud of it. Um, I was very artistic, so I was really into uh, music. So ever since middle school, I was in, in the band, in marching band, and I played the trumpet and the saxophone and the piano. And, and I, I tried playing the violin, but they didn't have a violin for lefties. And, and every time I'll try to hold the thing with my right hand, I'll go like this. So I kind of gave up on it because I couldn't hold the, the, the bow with my right hand. But I tried all kinds of instruments, the flute and the clarinet. So I loved music, I loved being in marching band and I did the rose parade like three times. And I was having lots of fun with that. 
And then after that, I, I was really into um, drawing, and I loved painting with acrylics and pastels. And so I was, you know, I, I started seeing myself as being an animator for Walt Disney because I love watching um, Cinderella and, and, um, and The Little Mermaid. And I said, oh, I think I could see myself, you know, working and painting and, and doing stuff like that. So when I started college, I met my, um, my first teacher there. I took a, an English class. And my very first teacher there, um, when, when, she, when we turned in our first assignment, which was to write an autobiographical essay, she pulled me aside after class and she said, Reina, you're a writer, that's your calling. And at that point, I didn't know what being a writer was. And um, so I kind of didn't listen to her and I, you know, like, no, I'm a painter, I wanna paint. And one time she found me on campus and I was working on a painting and she walked up behind me and she was looking over my shoulder and I'm trying to impress her with my painting skills. And then she looked at me and she said, Reina, you're better off being a writer. <laughs> so after that, you know, she just kept bugging me and bugging me about being a writer and I had no idea why, why she was telling me this. And then um, she started giving me books written by Latina authors. And up until then, I had never really written anything, you know, about Latino literature. So the first book she gave me was The Moths by Ma Maria Elena Viramontes. And then she gave me The House on Mango Street. And then she gave me um, The Stories of Eva Luna by Isabel Allende. She gave me Like Water for Chocolate. And that was really her way of trying to convince me that that, that, that was the path I had to follow. And, and, and it worked, because once I started reading those stories, I understood why she was telling me that, that, that I should be a writer. Because I could finally see myself and my experiences reflected in those stories. Whereas in Sweet Valley High, you know, I don't think so. So um, after I read all these books, she finally convinced me that, that was, that's what I was supposed to do. And I transferred to UC Santa Cruz after two years being at PCC. And I transferred as a creative writing major. And, and I have to say that, you know, that my teacher knew what I didn't know. And when I started at UC Santa Cruz and I started um, working, thinking more seriously about my writing, I, I, I was able to see myself as, as somebody who had a lot of stories to share, who could contribute another voice to Latino literature. And, um, and I started working on this book. And the reason why I started working on this book was because that experience of being in Mexico for those 10 years without my parents was something that I had never forgotten, was something that was always in the back of my mind. And, and so when I started exploring with my writing, it always went there, you know. Every little story kind of er originated from those 10 years. So I decided to start, to start writing this story. And at first it was an autobiographical account of my life in Mexico. But having such a vivid imagination, I started making things up. And I said, well, I can call this an autobiography. You know, I mean, I'm making up a lot of things. <laughs> so, I went, so then I decided it was going to be a novel, and it was going to be fiction. And once I decided that, that kind of gave me the freedom to really just go wherever the story wanted to take me. And, and that is where it, it took me. The, the story is not, you know, it, it, it's not pretty much what happened to me. But I used a lot of my experiences to write this story. So for example, like Juana's life in Mexico, living in poverty with her family, that was something that I didn't have to do any research for that because you know, I just had to think about my own life and, and um, go to Mexico and see my family and, and where they live to, to write that. Um, my uncle, you know, he lives, he still lives in a little shack like this with no running water. And, and so when I was writing Juana's story, I pretty much drew a lot on my experiences. And I also drew a lot on experiences of my family members. 
uh, of stories that I heard, real stories that happened to real people. Um, I also teach, right now I'm a teacher uh, for LAUSD, I'm teaching English as a second language to adults. So I talk to my students and they share their experiences with me. So, so all of that, all of that helped me to, to write this story. And there's one story, when, when I was working on my novel, um, my grandmother died in, in, um, in Mexico. She got stung by a scorpion on her hand when she was sleeping. And, and by the time we got to Mexico, she, um, she had already died because we got there like five hours too late. And when I was down there, I, you know, I was working through my novel, I was like almost done with the first draft. And I, I, was, I talked to my aunt about this book that I was writing. And she started telling me a story of, of um, a person who lived in her neighborhood. And he was a man who had decided to come here to the United States and cross the border. And he brought along his little boy with him. And his family didn't hear from him. And uh, many weeks went by and the family didn't know what happened to him until eventually they learned that he had been bitten by a snake when he was crossing the border. And his smuggler left him and the little boy behind and he and moved on with the rest of the group. And, and this man died from the snake bite and his little boy died of dehydration. And when she told me that story, I, I started thinking about his children, the ones that he had left behind and what they must have been going through. And that's when um, my character Adelina was born. When I started thinking about his daughter and what she must have gone through not knowing what, what happened to her father. So little stories like that, that I heard um, kind of influenced the, the writing of this book. And so I'm gonna read to you um, one excerpt from the book and I'm just gonna read the very first chapter because I know uh, many of you haven't read the book yet. So I'm gonna introduce you to Adelina who is the second character in my book. And um, so Adelina is a 31 year old social worker living in Los Angeles and she has spent many, many years trying to find her father. And at the, the very first chapter, you learn what happened to her father all those years ago. That's your father's grave, the old man repeated in a voice that was barely audible. He'd been silent most of the crossing. When he had to speak at all, he did so softly, as if this place was as holy as church, the U.S. border. Adelina looked at the large pile of rocks he was pointing to. The old man had to be mistaken. Her father wasn't under there. He couldn't be. She wiped the sweat from her forehead with the back of her hand. Then she used her hand as a shield to cover her eyes from the glare of the sun. She took a few steps forward until she was in the shadow of a boulder towering above them and the pile of rocks. Could her father really be buried there? She gulped. Her mouth was dry and swallowing made her throat ache as if she were swallowing a prickly pear, spines and all. She felt tears burning her eyes and quickly rubbed them dry. It's not too late to turn around and go back, the old man said. Maybe it would be best. Adelina took a deep breath, then turned to look at the sea of shrub and cactus stretching out around her. That terrain seemed to never end. It had taken almost all day to get here. They hadn't been caught by the immigration patrol this time. She looked back at the old man. He must have been a good coyote back in the day when he was young and agile. Even now, with 60 years on his back, a bad eye and a lame knee, he managed to get her past the ever watching eyes of La Migra on their second attempt. We can turn around now, the old man said again. You've seen his grave. Let that be enough. Adelina shook her head and began to walk down to the pile. I didn't come to see a grave she said as she took off her backpack. I came to find my father, and I will take him with me, even if I have to carry his bones on my back. The old man looked at her with surprise, but said nothing. Yet Adelina knew what he was thinking. She had lied to him. She had not told him she was planning to dig up the body, and if it really was her father, take him back with her. He would not have brought her here had she told him this. 
She bent down and began to remove the rocks one by one. So many rocks on top of him, so much weight to support. Maybe once the rocks were gone, maybe once he was free, she too would be free. It may not even be him, the old man said as he grabbed her wrist to stop her from removing any more rocks. I have to know. For 19 years, I have not known what happened to my father. You have no idea what it's like to live like that, not to know. Today, I'll know the truth. She yanked her arm and continued removing the rocks. The old man walked away from her. She tried to hurry. One by one, the rocks were lifted. Some rocks rolled down and hit her knees. Her fingers began to hurt from being scraped. There was still a possibility the old man was right. Maybe it wasn't her father, but which would be worse, that it was her father or that it wasn't? Nineteen years not knowing, too many years thinking he had abandoned them. Look, the old man said. Adelina turned around and saw a cloud of dust rising in the distance. La migra, we must hide. Adelina turned back to the rocks and in desperation began throwing them against the boulder. She had to know who was buried there. She had to see for herself if he really was her father. What are you doing? Hide! The old man quickly made his way to a crevice in the boulder, but Adelina kept throwing off the rocks and didn't move from where she was. Let them come, she said. Let La Migra find us. Maybe they can help us take this man's bones back. She gasped at the side of a small metal cross. She quickly lifted more rocks and then covered her mouth with her hand to stifle a cry. She looked back at the old man. It's a white rosary with heart-shaped beads, yes? He asked. Adelina nodded, looking down at the rusted metal cross, at the white beads, at the bones that had once been a hand. The old man hadn't lied. He was clutching the rosary so tightly when I found him dead, right there where he is now the old man said. It's as if he had been praying right until his death, praying for a miracle, perhaps. The coyote just left him here to die. Your father was bitten by a snake. The coyote proudly left him here thinking La Migra would find him. Look, here they come now. Adelina turned around and saw, saw a white vehicle approaching. La Migra was here, but they were 19 years too late to save her father. Thank you. So you can see where I got that idea. <laughs> it was kind of it was it was funny because I when I started writing this book, like I had an idea of what the book was gonna be about, but little by little it started changing and changing and it started turning into something else and and I decided that for because for a long time I was fighting it I, and I was fighting that change because I said no I set out to write this story and after a while I kind of gave up on it and I kind of just let it take me wherever it was going to take me and and this is where it took me so um I hope you guys enjoy it and I'll be back in September and then I guess I'll hear it from you. <laughs> so for now, I hope, I really hope you do enjoy it. And I'm looking forward to coming back in September and um, getting a chance to, to talk with you guys some more and answering your questions. And um, so I think it's going to be wonderful. And I feel really happy um, that you're going to read my book. And, and like I said, I really hope you do enjoy it and you get something out of it. And one of, the, one of the reasons why I wrote this book was because when I, when I started reading like all this Latino literature and all these stories about immigrants, I realized that most of these stories take place in the U.S. and most of the stories are, are about immigrants here and you know what they go through here and their hardships and all the struggles that, that they face in the country. But my question was, how come nobody's writing about the ones that are left behind and what they go through? And for me, it's like, well, that's the other side of the immigrant experience. And um, so I, I feel really lucky that, that I was able to contribute another, another um, point of view in this um, whole immigration 
thing and, and, and the experience of an immigrant because it's, it's not only those who come here, but it's also about the ones they are leaving behind, especially the, the children that, that are left behind without their parents. So um, thank you so much. I, I, I want to uh, thank Raina for being here today. Uh, she, of course, did come from California just for the day, so that was quite, a, quite an adventure. And uh, she'll be back, as she said, in September, um, three days. So she'll be um, going throughout the region then, and we'll hope you've had a chance to read the book and um, have lots of questions for her. And we'll see you all in September. Well, before then, because I want you to come to my programs. <laughs> Thank you.